Welcome back. In this segment, we will explore how the various free speech theories have been integrated in a number of global public policy initiatives. I will present those initiatives and highlight how the concept related to the protection of freedom of expression and information have been made central to those public policies. The earlier free speech theories that we uh, have discussed were largely theories about censorship and what censorship prohibits and denies, human autonomy, ability to make moral judgment, dignity. It prohibits the search for truth. Freedom of expression, on the other hand, builds tolerance and is essential to self-governing societies and to good governance in general, to the ability of governments to implement good policies. The notions of autonomy, good governance, self-development, truth, they all have, in one way or another, largely survived the time, and they have gone global. I have already mentioned the fact that courts around the world repeatedly link the protection of freedom of expression to the working of a democracy. The importance of accessing information and speaking freely, particularly, but not only, with regard to democracy and governance has been put forward and highlighted time and time again. This is not just a brilliant political theory or philosophy or indeed in the case of Amatya Sen, a brilliant economic thesis. These have been largely evidenced as well and upheld by international and national institutions, including, as I have mentioned, court around the world, but not only. It has also become an essential feature of the legislative framework of the majority of countries around the world, which have, for instance, adopted access to public information laws and protected freedom of expression in their constitution, using very much similar concepts and terms as those that I have highlighted before. But let me just highlight a few examples of global public policies as uh, opposed to uh, a national legislation or a national court. First, the Rio Declaration on Environment and Development, also referred to as the Rio Declaration, is a culmination of the 1992 UN Conference on Environment and Development. And it states, and I'm quoting from them, environmental issues are best handled with the participation of all concerned citizens at all relevant level. At the national level, each individual shall have appropriate access to information concerning the environment that is held by public authorities. And they shall have the opportunity to participate in decision-making processes State shall facilitate and encourage public awareness and participation by making information widely available. Effective access to judicial and administrative proceedings, including redress and remedy, shall be provided. So here you have uh, a central uh, document, um, part of the commitment of the world to address environmental issues and indeed climate change that put heavy emphasis on the ability of global citizens to access information and on the duty of governments to provide that, form that information to them so that they know what is happening in their environment. More recently, the Sustainable Development Goal, or SDG, as uh, they have come to be known, were adopted by the United Nations in September 2015. They seek to stimulate actions over the next 15 years in areas that have been deemed of critical importance for humanity and the planet. They build on the MDG, the Millennium Development Goal, and complete what these did not manage to achieve. They seek to realize the human rights of all and to achieve gender equality and the empowerment of all women and girls. They are integrated and indivisible and balance the three dimensions of sustainable development, the economic, social, and environmental. 
And those SDGs, or Sustainable Development Goals, include, and I quote from them, to develop effective, accountable, and transparent institutions at all levels, to ensure responsive, inclusive, participatory, and representative decision-making at all levels, to ensure public access to information and protect fundamental freedom in accordance with national legislation and international agreement. The two indicators against which governments will have to report include, for instance, the number of verified cases of killing, kidnapping and forced disappearance, arbitrary detention and torture of journalists, associated media personnel, trade unionists and human rights advocates. And they are also requested to report back on the implementation of constitutional, statutory and or policy guarantees for public access to information. So here what you have are uh, within the most important public policy document of the, the decade, the, the forthcoming decade, the SDGs, you have centrally uh, placed the necessity for government, the duty imposed of governments to protect freedom of expression and information and the obligations to report back on how they are doing in terms of protecting that um, access to information and the ability of the press to do its work. That's a very important symbol, I think, of the centrality recognized to freedom of expression and information by the world, by, by the United Nations and the Member State. The inclusion of information in the Sustainable Development Goal or a great deal, if not exclusively, at least largely, to civil society organizations. I know that because I was part of the debates when SDGs were, at the beginning at least, um, being debated. And there were a few opposition to the idea that information and expression were central to sustainable development. However, very quickly, we have referred back to the thinking and writing of eminent thinkers, backed up by economic data, including from Amartya Sen, for instance, to demonstrate that information and expression are indeed central to sustainable development. And in all those instances, in all those arguments, we have used what was written back in the 17th, 18th and 19th century to demonstrate that information and expression, autonomy, dignity and truth are as relevant now to human society as they were in uh, the time they were first thought out. Civil society organizations have widely circulated the notion, for instance, that information is the oxygen of democracy essential for development, openness, accountability, and good governance. Civil society has played probably one of the most important role in globalizing this concept, in globalizing the link between individual development, self-development, economic development, and good governance, and integrating those links and those concepts in the positions and practices of global institutions such as the United Nations, of global decision making such as the SDGs and indeed of national government. For instance, the organization I had the great honor of leading for nine years, Article 19, focused heavily on developing policy and practical steps linking development with freedom of expression and information. Let me quote from uh, one of Article 19 earlier report, which summarizes well the importance of freedom of expression and information to the fight against poverty and for sustainable development. Chernobyl and earlier nuclear accidents, the spread of AIDS throughout the world, have contributed to the realization that full freedom of information is not a luxury but may be literally a matter of life and death. The denial of information vital to health, 
such as arises from the dumping of unlabeled pesticides and pharmaceuticals in the developing world, for example, is censorship to be opposed just as much as the more classic manifestation of censorship in book banning, radio jamming, or the destruction of printing press. Another demonstration of the importance of the concept central to the protection of freedom of expression to current policy debates is that linked to the right to truth. Let me explain what it is. On the 21st of December 2010, the United Nations General Assembly proclaimed that the 24th of March will be the International Day for the Right to the Truth concerning gross human rights violations and for the dignity of victims. Quoting from the Secretary General of the United Nations then, Ban Ki-moon, the right to the truth which is both an individual and collective right, is essential for victims, but also for society at large. Uncovering the truth of human rights violations of the past can help prevent human rights abuses in the future. So what is a right to truth? It is the right to know the truth about the abuses people have suffered. It is a right to know the truth about the identity of the killers and the people who torture. It is the right to know the truth about the causes that gave rise to the violations and, if appropriate, the ultimate fate or whereabout of those that were forcibly disappeared. Establishing the truth about what happened and who is responsible for serious crimes help communities to understand the causes of past abuse and to end it. Without accurate knowledge of past violations, it is difficult for a society to prevent them from happening again. That is a fundamental theory and a reason behind the search for truth. And I think very few people will um, deny its um, accuracy. Without knowing what has happened, we are far more likely to repeat it again and again. The truth can also assist in the healing process after traumatic event. It can restore personal dignity after years of stigmatization. It can safeguard against impunity and public denial. I, I have to say, uh, based on a personal, um, personal experience, that the right to truth is particularly important for families whose um, children whose husband, whose wife have disappeared because of violations. And often for decades, they will never know what has happened to them, when and if they were killed and the majority were, and where are their bodies buried. The right to truth for them is a right to know what happened to their loved ones and to find closure in the immense pain that has been uh, given to them through the act of uh, their government. I am not arguing here that the concept of a right to truth finds its root in the philosophical argument on the th search for truth that we have discussed in, um, in the first segment. There is at least one fundamental difference. The 20th century right to truth tends to presuppose one truth and it wants or seeks closure. It, it, it seeks an end to the pain and it wants a truth, something that it can look uh, up. These are fundamentally absent from the assumptions governing the search for truth, which is all about exploration and the water, the dynamic process. But the 20th uh, century concept of truth-seeking is not that very far from the right to truth of the 20th century. They both insist on individuals' autonomy, on their capacities to make decisions, their right not to have information denied to them by some supra-authorities, assuming they know best, or for the sake of um, reconciliation, 
and for the sake of moving forward, we should not pass on that information. That is denying people their autonomy, and that is not uh, permissible. That is not acceptable. Both the 18th century concept of truth and the 20th century concept of the right to truth recognize a proce process of truth exploration, which involves balancing views and experiences, which involves looking for justice and looking for truth. And that can only be done through information, disclosure and participation. Both the 18th century concept of truth seeking and the 20th century concept of the right to truth stand against the idea that states are infallible. They both are premised on the idea that the people must know, the people must have access to the information, the individual and the society, in order to hold their government to account and in order for their government to act in a better fashion and to implement the policies that are needed. The right to truth in the 20th century is actually a fairly organized movement. It can be traced back to Latin America during and in the aftermath of the dictatorship that plagued the continent throughout the 1970s and 1980s. In 1998, the Inter-American Commission, and I will explain next week what this commission is all about. The Inter-American Commission, in a report regarding the case against Chile, recognized for the first time that every society has the inalienable right to know the truth about past events, as well as the motives and circumstances in which aberrant crimes came to be committed in order to prevent repetition of such act in the future. Since 1998, the right to the truth is understood as belonging not only to members of victims' families, but to all members of society, to a country and indeed to a continent. Outside Latin America, in South Africa, the Constitutional Court as well upheld the rights of victim, the right of the media, the right of the public to speak the truth about crimes, even if they were not the object of an amnesty. In this case, the, the court of South Africa held that truth-telling was the moral basis of a transition from the injustice of apartheid to democracy and constitutionalism, the moral basis. To sum up, freedom of expression has been the object of a number of political theories over the last two, three centuries. Throughout this week, we have briefly highlighted the main, but by, by, by far not the only, theories and theorists. The central notion of autonomy, dignity, truth-seeking, personal self-development, and self-governing societies have been presented and discussed. We have also seen how this concept remains central to our political thinking, to global public policies, and have also been translated and adapted to the reality of the late 20th century such as through the concept and the political, the organized movement of the right to truth. I will end this segment with uh, the quote from the Constitutional Court of South Africa, which um, I have cited earlier, because I think it is central to the way our global society is uh, confronting many, or ought to confront many hardships. So let me quote from them again. Truth telling is a moral basis of a transition from the injustice of apartheid to democracy. Thank you very much.